We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? And welcome back to O'Reilly Radio. This is uh, episode 133B, the science episode. In fact, uh, here, let me just roll that. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. That's right, it works, bitches. Okay, so I still am your host, Andy Cowan, and I still have Fred Sims, Daniel Atherton, and Stephen Griffith. Welcome back, gentlemen, and uh, let's let's get into this. Oh, wait, there was a, there was a, a long comment by one of our one of our listeners here. Uh, read something interesting. Speaking of Obama, last Obama's last days, there was an article stating that Obama could, if he followed certain steps, circumvent the unwillingness of the Senate to accept or deny his Supreme Court candidate. Oh, really? Uh, take it as giving up their right, for lack of better words, and therefore confirm his own candidate without approval from them? Huh. I don't know about that, but if you have a link, if you have a link to that, I would like to have it and go through it, because that's something that I think we need to see. We need to talk about that. Um, And boy, would he be uh, pissing off the alt-right with, uh, you know, circumventing their their obstructions and stripping it away from their president-elect. That would... I, w- I want to stop calling them alt right and just call them racists from now on. <laughs> well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know that they're necessarily racist, but they are probably bigots. No, because it's not always. It's not pretty much the the, the, the always right race. wing of the party that is all about white nationalism. So I just want to call them racists. Is, is it just white nationalism? I thought it was a little bit more than that. It's mostly white nationalism. Uh, okay, yeah. All right, so thank you, Bella. You'll you'll give us that link, and that'll be that'll be fantastic. And we'll we'll pop that in the show notes here somewhere, and, and we'll talk about it. Uh, but into science, 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 science. Okay, so scientists discover antibodies that neutralize HIV strains. Bum, bum, bum. What is this about? This was found by uh, uh, by Amber, even though she's not here. Okay. DRC zero one uh, antibody. Why is this not coming up? Hang on. Okay. All right. Oh one. Carry on. What was that? Um. There was a discovery back in 2010 of an antibody called VRC one. Uh, it can stop up to 90 percent of HIV strains from infecting human cells. It works the same way as uh, the N6 uh, antibody. Both block the virus by binding to a part of the HIV enveloped call, enveloped called the CD4 binding site. Uh, this prevents the virus from attaching itself to the immune cells. Uh, however, N6, which is the new discovered one, can better tolerate changes in the HIV envelope, so it can affect m- more strains than the VRC01. Interesting. Okay, so for example, one of the key ways HIV evades the immune system is by gathering and attaching sugars, which tend to loosen the antibody grip. N6, however, is not affected by this change. Okay. So, continue to test N6 as an intravenous infusion in clinical trials to see if it safely prevents HIV infection in humans due to its potency. N6 may offer stronger and more durable prevention and treatment benefits, and researchers may be able to administer it subcutaneously into the fat under the skin rather than intravenously. Ooh. So, so it would be an injectable. Yeah. So, in addition, its ability to neutralize nearly all HIV strains 
uh, would be advantageous for both prevention and treatment strategies. So now, that's, that's my question something. is, um, would you have to get regular injections or would it be a one and done? Hmm. Would it be like getting your flu shot or would it be a just straight up? Hi, this is like uh, well, it would be a vaccine. It would just be yeah, an injection not, of antibodies, so it'd be more like a flu shot. Yeah, well, unless the body then began to manufacture the antibodies from having it injected. Like I, I want to know more about yeah. this because this is huge for for the world, not, not just here in the states, but again, when you're looking at uh, a numbered out, outbreaks throughout. The African continent. Uh, there's also a giant uh, resurgence in uh, HIV AIDS in northern Russia. It, it's a global phenomenon. It's a global virus, and it needs to be stopped. Okay, let's see. Um, the uh, th- this is out on the DailyMail.co.uk, and it does not provide a link back to the source of this research, which is a red flag. It's one of those things that indicates that, oh, wait, something's not right here. However, if uh, using a little Google Foo and proper proper searching techniques, let's see. And I found it at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, the NIAID.NIH.gov. Say that five times fast, and this is November fifteenth, twenty sixteen. So this is this is it. Okay, so the director Anthony uh, Fachu Fakui. F- uh, yeah, well, there you go. I've already mispronounced something. The discovery and characterization of this antibody with exceptional breadth and potency against HIV provides an important new lead for the development of strategies to prevent and treat HIV infection. Uh, so they're saying 98% of HIV uh, isolated tested. Um, so this is mostly it's all the same thing. So this is this is where they they pulled they the pulled the info. They pulled like all of it. I mean that's almost outright plagiarism, and and without citing it's it. the Daily Mail. It's the Daily Mail, yeah. Uh, but this actually you know has the article and also for the World Health Organization um, that uh, director. Director Anthony Facau, Facu, Fauci, Fauci. I can't pronounce Anthony that. F. Yes, Anthony F. M. D. is available to comment on the research, so we could get a comment from him, and that's important to know. Um, research team included uh, scientists from the NIAID's Laboratory of Immunoregulation and Vaccine Research Center. So this, it now it does say a more durable prevention and treatment benefits. So I'm thinking that no, this doesn't this doesn't create the antibodies within your own body to to fight it. So this would be something that you would have to have boosters for, like getting uh, like a depo shot for you know uh, uh, for birth control. So it'd be a regular thing. I think so. But they they say that it has a chance to just be done subcutaneously. So it would be. A shallow injection uh, yeah. that you would be able to take on a, a schedule. Yeah, um, in probably no, into, this is, into your butt, you know, and subcutaneous fat. Yeah. Or, or it could be the upper arm. Um, no, this. No, man, not this, in these guns. No, it's got to go in the fat. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this, this is great. This is fantastic <laughs> yes. news, uh, and hopefully, this this lead will actually lead to something more permanent or permanent treatment. Absolutely. I mean, it's definitely a, it's a step in, it's a big giant leap in the right direction. So this is cool. I'm going to copy this link and I'm going to put that in here next to the daily mail um, link. So there we go. Okay. So that was our deep dive into, into HIV and now into Saturn news. Terrifying news. Record lows for Antarctic sea ice. Now, this is not, this is another reporting agency, uh, you know, CNN. Uh, Amid higher global temperatures, sea ice at record lows at the poles. Um, 
it's it's bad, guys. It's really bad. Um, now, we've been hearing about this for a long time, so really this is not anything new. This is just more data points on how bad it's getting. But, no, I don't want to play that. Sometimes. Go away. Stop well, that. This actually is new. And so when you get into the story, it, it even says, for okay. what appears to be the first time since scientists began keeping track, sea ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic are at record lows this time of year. The Arctic has been showing declines in sea ice for a number of years. However, the Antarctic had actually been showing gains in sea ice. And so this is the first year that it's actually uh, starting to show lower levels. Oh, uh, you know why it was the gains? Is because the ozone, the hole in the ozone layer had recovered. Because that hole was over Antarctica. And that was melting sea ice. And now that that hole has been repaired because, you know, thanks Trump. Yeah, we, we went ahead and got rid of the CFCs out of the, out of the hairspray. hairspray yep. And all the other aerosols everywhere because we realized there was a problem. Thank, thank you researchers that were researching the Venusian atmosphere. Even though uh, Trump lived in what was apparently the only airtight apartment that's ever existed, that was how, he, how he survived amazing. that complete uh, vacuum is, is unknown to me, but yeah. he did. <laughs> Fred and I are commenting on this little, you know, what, an amazing gaffe by President-elect Trump uh, when he was likening Getting rid of CFCs, you know, EPA regulations for that, not disbelieving that that had any effect whatsoever, likening that to the, to the quality of air in coal mines. Okay. So, yeah, that, that happened. That was said. That's on video. He'll deny it. So, moving along. Um, so As a further addendum to the story, yeah. though, the... Mm-hmm. About the Antarctic sea ice, I actually just posted a subsequent one to this where the North Pole, this came is from Science Alert and came out on uh, 19th of November. Okay. Uh, 2016, so I think it's supposed to be coming out. Tomorrow? It's misdone for today. But that the... Uh, <laughs> future postings. We're living in the future. <laughs> but the Arctic is Time actually zones. 36 degrees warmer than it should be for average. This is a national security threat. Elaborate on that for the people that don't understand what that means. Okay. Th- this is actually, a- a- we are at a-, a threshold now where this is affecting national security because this is an environmental threat, a preventable and possibly reversible environmental threat to uh, land to population um and with the arctic and antarctic ices going away this is opening brand new water passages that we don't have data on that we don't have boats in the water you know who does you patrol russia russia has been mapping the under under ice areas of the Arctic for as long as they've had submarines. This is a national security threat. Te- and they actually also have more icebreakers than we do. Because yeah. they need them. This In fact, is all a of giant our national security threat. All of our icebreaking duty is down to two boats now, and both of them are part of the Coast Guard. That's it. Mm-hmm. Well, just... We don't need icebreakers because we've been denying climate change. We just do it the slow way. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, I wish you were wrong, but you're not. I'm not. It's uh, kind of my thing. Okay, so uh, the article, just to circle back real quick to to our information from our, our wonderful chat room participants. Um, the article about Obama can appoint Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court if the Senate does nothing is actually out on Washington Post, so it's not not one of the, the random weird wonk blogs out there. Um, and it was, oh, okay, so Gregory L. Diskant is a senior partner at the law firm of Patterson Belknap, Belknap? 
Webb and Tyler, and a member of the National Governing Board of Common Cause. So this is who is um, you know writing this article. On November 12th, 1975, while I was serving as a clerk to the Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, Justice William uh, O'Douglas resigned. On November 28th, President Gerald Ford nominated Paul Stevens for the vacant seat. Nineteen days after receiving the nomination, the Senate voted 98-0 to zero to confirm the president's choice. Two days later, I had the pleasure of seeing Ford present Stevens to the court for his swearing in. The business of the court continued unabated. There were no four to four decisions that term. Today, the system seems broken. Okay, moving right along, you're just going to talk and talk and talk. How does this actually happen, sir? Um, here's how that would work. Okay. <clears throat> The president has nominated Garland and submitted his nomination to the Senate. The president should advise the Senate that he will deem its failure to act by a specified reasonable date in the future to constitute a deliberate waiver of its right to give advice and consent. What date? The historical average between nomination and confirmation is 25 days. The longest wait has been 125 days. That suggests that 90 days is a perfectly reasonable amount of time for the Senate to consider Garland's nomination. If the Senate fails to act by the assigned date, Obama could conclude that it has waived its right to participate in the process and could exercise his appointed appointment power by naming Garland to the Supreme Court. Presumably, the Senate would then bring suit, challenge, uh, challenge the appointment. This should not be viewed as a constitutional crisis, but rather as a healthy dispute between the president and the Senate about the meaning of the Constitution. This kind of thing has happened before. In 1932, the Supreme Court ruled that the Senate did not have the power to rescind a confirmation vote after the nominee had already taken office. More recently, the court determined that recess appointments by the president were no longer proper because the Senate no longer took recesses. Interesting. So I will go but ahead and... problematic. Oh, boy, is it. Yeah, and here's why. Mainly, and I'm not even going to get into the problems listed in this story, but this story was written in April of this year. Yeah. You don't have 90 days from now until Obama's no longer the president. No, yeah, he would have He would have already had to He would have had but... to have do, done this. <clears throat> so at this point, he would only be able to give them a period of time that, you know, like granted, it does say 25 to 125 days, so they have done it in less than a month before. But, you know, it. I don't know that he would try something like this with less than a reasonable amount of time for them to decide. It is unlikely that he would. Push it. Yeah. It's unlikely that he would. But yeah. no. there was a way. And it would be it would have been really interesting. Yeah, we missed that window. Yeah. yeah. But it would have been a cool thing to see play out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I imagine that he didn't really think that uh, a president-elect Trump was in the cards, just like... No one did. Not even Trump. Trump didn't even think he was going to get it, which is why he didn't bother to prepare for anything. <clears throat> okay. So moving right back to climate change. Um, so Arctic sea ice. Um, ice ends up being white and very reflective. Yeah. Having a white and reflective surface allows more of the infrared radiation to be reflected out back out into space. Having more ice ends up being a cooling effect. When you lose ice, then you have darker surfaces which absorb more of, more of the heat. So losing it has the opposite effect. It has a warming effect. It has a continued warming effect. So the more ice you lose, the worse it gets. Now... You're going to lose coastline? Um, You're going to have sea incursion? Uh, you can change salinity? As I say, you're going, going to reduce the salinity? A giant there's, there's other things that are with this, which is entire global weather patterns. Because the sea ice, you remember that whole, um, oh, go, go, what, what was it? The, um, that polar band coming down, down through the United States? Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it was called. Um, no clue. They, they gave, they gave it some, some fancy name. Um, but that will change because there's no, no more ice up there. 
There's no more cold front. Yeah. So all of the United States is going to end up getting warmer. Yeah. Um, what you can see mostly is that areas that are already arid are going to continue to be arid and get worse. Areas so this that herring incursion in Africa is going yeah. to continue. Areas that have a large rainfall, think monsoons, it will get worse. We can also is that idea of global warming doesn't necessarily mean and climate change doesn't necessarily mean everything's just going to get hotter. No, no. It's more extreme, more extreme weather phenomena. Yeah, more extreme. We're not going to lose – it will still snow in places. It will also not rain in places. Or like some places it will snow a little bit like it – you know, it never – it always just be decently, never really did it much. And then in other places it will be, you know, four feet in a day when that never happened. And – Flooding's going to get worse. Yeah. Um, we've already seen extreme amounts of flooding in the UK. Uh, people displaced from their homes. We've seen extreme flooding here along the Mississippi. Um, and it's just going to get worse. It's a national security threat. It is threatening well, our citizens. It is threatening our lands. Well, this is a national yeah. security threat. In... In the days when our species was very young and out on the Sahara, and there were no political boundaries, if the if the food went away, if the weather got bad, you were nomadic. You picked up your village and you went where the food was. You went to a more hospitable place. That is how we survived. We now have <clears throat> imaginary border lines drawn everywhere. Political borders, citizenship, things of, of this nature. One of the reasons that people leave their country is because it's no longer a place that they can live. Micronesia. Yeah. The, the nations that are very low, I mean, we've already had island nations that have up and left because the, the salt water content took all of their fresh water. They, they couldn't live there anymore. In another couple years, they simply wouldn't have any land to stand on. It would be a sandbar. So, at, that, at this point, we have immigration problems. Because people are simply having to become migratory. They can't go home. There is no home to go back to. You can't deport them back home. There's no home. They are now a mobile nation. I mean, we're a nation we, of refugees. Yeah, it's an yeah. Enormous, we're going to start saying more climate, it's a climate refugees refugee occur. crisis. Yeah, yeah. And nations like the United States, we can absorb them. We do have a lot of land. We can do this. More people means more need for services. More need for services means more jobs open up to service the population. It's short-sighted to just say, no, go away. And it's completely fear-motivated when they want to round up all the Muslims. So that's, that's that with, uh, with Arctic ice. It's not going to get better. We can't do it. I hate to be negative, but at this point, the people of the world have not stood up and thought forward enough to actually make any meaningful changes that will reverse it. We are not even slowing it down, much less reverse it. So, though, yes, right now, we could change it. We could. But it would take a global effort, and we simply do not have the motivation to do that. We hate each other. We hate each other in this country much less working with the Paris Accords, much less working with China or Putin. We can't get along. We can't fight for the world to save us all. We don't have another planet. We're going to simply have to adapt to this change. It's coming. Get ready. It is the freight train. We're still on the tracks. 
it's not going to stop. And we can't tell it to stop. We are completely impotent in this. Through lack of action and taking the wrong actions by electing people that don't even believe that it's happening. So and there we were already seeing people from NASA <clears throat> and from the American Security Complex mm-hmm. going president elect. Um, sorry to tell you this, but uh, climate change is real, and it is a great and dire threat, and you need to act on it. Yeah. Just because you don't want it to be real doesn't mean that it is. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> the only things that we can do as a people are our own individual things. Lower your own carbon footprint. Lower your your own emissions. Seek... Seek to make yourself more efficient. You know, uh, change change out all solar. your bulbs and out to LEDs. You know, just lower everything you can. Get get Musk's uh, solar roof installed. You know, you probably need a roof anyway. You know, th- things of that nature. Um, but that, that's that's enough of a soapbox, I imagine, on that. So, hey, what about mercury shrinking? No, oh, speaking <laughs> of shaking. global change, <laughs> we are not the only planet going through global change. No. Apparently, as. Uh, <laughs> NASA scientists recently found evidence pointing to the fact that Mercury is undergoing a planetary global contraction, meaning the solar system's smallest planet may be getting even smaller. Um, There is a a link back to NASA.gov, and in a prepared statement there, Tom Waters, a senior scientist at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, said, Unlike the Earth's Great Rift Valley, Mercury's Great Valley is not caused by the pulling apart of lithospheric plates due to plate tectonics. It is the result of the global contraction of one shrinking, of, of a shrinking one plate planet. Um, and, you know, basically NASA is saying that the likely explanation of the planet's outermost shell is buckling due to the cooling of Mercury's interior, causing the surface to contract and bend. So just kind of one of those really things you find on the Internet when you think of an entire planet shrinking. It's not something that I typically think about. In fact, I don't think about Mercury much at all, other than... The fascinating bit that at its poles, inside uh, craters at the poles, there is actually ice in that in the hottest planet, you know, closest to the sun and all that. So, funky. I don't know what it means, though. I, well, we, we keep looking to other planets in the solar system to understand our own. Like, you know, mentioning the CFCs. That was because researchers were studying the atmosphere of Venus and realized the greenhouse effect there. And they made the correlation to CFC production here in our environment, you know, working on a global warming trend and also that it was destroying the ozone layer um, through the CFC content, chlorofluorocarbons. So researching other planets will only help us on this one. Hopefully we learn and can actually take action on it before horrible, horrible turns of events. <clears throat> and Mercury is obviously researching us as well. It is determined that it wants none of us coming there, and so it's decided to make itself smaller <laughs> in an attempt to keep w- us from going. Would you say Mercury is in retrograde? Wow. <laughs> it, kind of, yeah. Let's be honest. Kind of, yes. <laughs> yeah, I had to go there. That's just a thing. Okay, so, and uh, in our last for the science roundup here, earthquakes triggered by fracking, not just wastewater disposal, study says. Aha! Oh, dear. Yes, so despite the U.S. Geological Survey maintaining that fracking is not the cause of most induced earthquakes, there uh, has actually been a study um, undertaken in Western Canada, according to research published Thursday in Science, The results defy the often-touted belief that the disposal of wastewater is the sole source of man-made earthquakes with fossil fuel extraction technique. The small earthquakes were always during or right after fracking, and they're also confined to a limited area. University of Calgary geophysicist and co-author of the research paper, David Eaton, told NewsHour. Before fracking, the sparsely populated area in Alberta, Canada, did not have a history of seismic activity. 
Oh, let's see. I and had to, to go even further. Uh, there were there was fracking in the UK. There were earthquakes in the UK because well, of fracking. It didn't just spontaneous seismic event oh. to a place that doesn't have seismic events. It was because of fracking. As as I understand, um, what happens with with the fracking itself is when they're injecting the the wastewater into. I know what they're saying here is that it's not related to that, but I, I think oh, you can't have one without the other because uh, they have to do something with the with the waste uh, as they're injecting it in to areas that don't currently have a fissure or anything that would act in a, a geological sense. What they're hitting is prehistoric fissures, things that did that have been dormant since before we were walking around, and that's what's now opening back up. That's not good. No, because those were the fissures and those were the plates that moved to form the continents as they exist now. Because yeah. if you look back at you know, the, the geographical studies and the way that our planet has evolved since those time periods, we were one landmass. And that separated itself through yeah. the use of plate tectonics hmm. to where we are now. So if you start reopening those old fissures that had stopped and had settled and those plates were long dormant, you're going to get movement that's going to cause geological shifts that our planet had stopped making it was done also yeah. these movements can affect the water table yeah so you can all of a sudden be contaminating the well water the drinking water of giant metropolitan areas in uh in the graphic that's currently on the screen here um for those of you that are that are watching in the in the video feed uh they're <coughs> The well that they're that they're using for the the chemical injection process, um, it goes well below the water table, and as they're pushing foreign matter into a substrate, it's forcing anything that's already in that substrate out, in all directions, including up towards the water table, which is why in um, you, you know. All you have to do is, is do a quick search on YouTube, and you will find people lighting rivers on fire. It's really cool, but horrible, because you know what that is. Methane. Oil. It's natural gas. It's, it's natural gas. It's methane. It's all, all sorts of anything that's flammable as a gas percolating through water that is typically used for drinking at some point along the line. There is not... Not tasty a water treatment infrastructure to deal with this nonsense. And there's not going to be. Well, if it continues enough, then yeah, we'll come up with something because that's what humans do. When we absolutely run out of something, we have to figure it out. You know, we'll that or they'll just, you know, up the ante on desalinization plants and we'll just, you know, suck it out of them out of the ocean. Which isn't energy efficient at all. No, it isn't. <clears throat> no. But it's a proven technology. Where and that would be easier than trying to remove, you know, percolated methane out of a out of a drinking water source. Though actually that, that should probably be easy too. I mean that would that would just be a, a you know a um uh centrifugal force. No, it it'd just be a, a standard hyd hydrolysis, I think is is what the term is. Um just anyway, that's science, and it's eleven o'clock. So my brain is starting to shut down on things uh, of that nature. So I'm sure that somebody out there uh, will please send us an email at a really radio podcast at gmail dot com, or, or send an angry voicemail to us at four seven zero two 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 six seven five nine, and tell us everything that we've got wrong, because I'm sure that you have opinions on it, and we want to hear them because we don't want to be inside an echo chamber. Please bring it on, and let's have a discussion. You can also discuss everything on our Facebook page. You know? Come on. Go do it. Go out to O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O.com. It's actually, it's, 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 yeah, right up there. 
you can see it right there in the header on this lovely v- window that we're presenting to the world. Okay, so that uh, that's going to do it for science. Oh boy, does it do it for science. Sorry for all those uh, sidelines and diatribes, but you know what? That's why you come here. You know what you are getting. <laughs> we don't just read the news. We analyze it. <laughs> we pull it apart. <laughs> okay. Sidelines and diatribes isn't on our t-shirt. Is that no- yeah, I guess that could be. That could be. Okay. 